Mike, 300 Hayes, take 301. That's right. <laughs> All right. Good thing you can edit this so it doesn't make me look too bad. <laughs> My name is Mike 300 Hayes. I grew up in Redmond, Washington. Never thought I'd be a pro fighter when I was a little kid. Uh, never thought that I'd make money uh, beating people up in a cage, but uh, that's the way it turned out. Uh, I started out fighting, um, you know, just here and there, like through high school, getting picked on a lot, um, having to defend myself and just be me and kind of learn like as I went. Um, I, I played lots of sports when I was young, never did anything like wrestling or kickboxing or taekwondo, none of that. I, I just played the, the normal stuff, basketball, soccer, a um, little bit of football, baseball. Um, I, I ski, wakeboard, and that was me growing up. I, di I didn't like working out. I didn't like training hard. I was honestly pretty lazy, and I got into my fair share of trouble, but it was just part of uh, what made me who I am today. Before my slide, we usually warm up like this where he'll start to throw a couple of combinations, but he has to pay attention to where the ball is all the time. And he'll have to alter his combination sometimes mid punch, just like you would in a real fight. So this starts to shock his central nervous system a little bit and get his body and mind working. One of Mike's most important assets in the fight is his eyes. He has great eyes. And this really starts to turn those eyes on. Again, just starting to warm up the hip flexors. That one doesn't want to move right now. Yeah. And that's a great example to see, like, Mike has a real tight right hip. Yeah. What we'd probably ask him to do is go and we take this ball over here and he'd roll it out a little bit. It's a good indicator to see kind of what's working with the body and what's not working with the body. So as a trainer, we're trying to get him moving. The only way to make sure that he stays healthy is by making sure that everything in the central nervous system down through his muscular system is functioning properly. So we're just basically activating everything, making sure it's loose and turned on. That means that every joint's going to be stable and ready to accept you know, the, the task at hand, whatever we're asking him to do. So one of the hardest parts in MMA is to keep your fighter healthy. Um, and these are little tricks that have been passed on uh, through Emil Verbowski, our strength and conditioning coach. And uh, we really haven't had too many problems with injuries at all, really. Um, just as long as we do a smart warm-up, sometimes it takes a while. That's one of the biggest uh, changes in what I've done over the past couple of years. It came from Emil Verbonski. Um, I used to work out, you know, warm up for 10 minutes maybe, work out for an hour and a half or two hours. Um, especially when it comes to like my weight workouts, but since I started uh, working with Emil and Eric, it's been more, you know, like a progressive workout or warm up, um, where you're warming up for, you know, almost an hour and it just all kind of blend into the weight workout. Um, whereas I'll end up doing the weights for like maybe 25, 30 minutes and that's it. Um, and that's plenty. Um, especially for me, like Eric said, I don't want to get hurt. Um, that's a big part of it. So if I can gradually increase my strength, you know, little by little, then that's awesome. I don't need to make giant uh, gains all at once. I just got to not get hurt so I can continue to train and continue to fight. Now let's go in step again. And you see now, wow, yeah. that hip flexibility has increased now with Mike, so he's able to, to do what I want him to do. Uh, like I said, this was the tool that we used to identify the problem. And uh, little things like this are, are just great tools. Um, and Emil's got hundreds of little tricks like this. This is just something you get through like, uh, they have like school PE catalogs, stuff uh -huh. like that. It's really designed for little kids to learn how to, uh, to basically do things like catch, because it's really easy to catch because it's so light and you know, so it travels slow and you squeeze it, you know. So it's just for a little kid's tool for like, to say, get a second grader to learn how to catch you know, and the progression of like child development, like it would be like, okay, so okay, Mike, now we're gonna we're gonna move this way while we catch, and then we're gonna move this way. And for little kids, you know, it, it builds up that foundation. So you know, learning to walk before you run, and there's a very specific like age group for okay, you're you're five years old, you should be able to catch a ball. Okay, you're six years old, you should be able to catch a ball while running. You're seven years old, you should be able to jump and catch a ball, land and throw. You know, things like this with these progressions. Um, that's what they're used for, and then we just kind of use it for, like, 
I said, warming up, identifying problems, so we know what to work on. So you feel that this helps Mike with his ABCs and colors and... Absolutely. I don't remember. You know, he's a fighter, so he's not too smart. So we start at the kindergarten level and we'll work up, you know? I'll edit that out for you, Mike. <laughs> I'm okay with that. This sport is, it's extreme competition. Uh, when people look at it, they see it as two people fighting, not liking each other, trying to hurt each other. But that's not the case. Most of the people that I fight, I end up being friends with afterwards. You gain a new respect for the, the competition, the heart, and the, the courage that it takes for one person to step in the ring against you or in the cage. And, uh, I mean, there's no other feeling like it, um, having that cage door locked behind you. And so when you go up in competition against somebody like that that really, like, pours everything they have into the fight, you definitely earn a healthy respect for that person. Like we read the... Uh Kindergarten clock, kindergarten fifth class, or something like that, basically. <laughs> have fun with some things. So usually we start off nice and easy. I'll say, okay, Mike, roll underneath. Again, just warming them up. Then I'll say, go over the top. I know that if Mike can bob and roll underneath, and he can jump straight over. It means he can throw a punch at any time and he can check a kick at any time. So really, really basic things. Just to start to get his body kind of uh, in tone with its most efficient position for accomplishing the task that we need to accomplish. So now that's where we're rushing a little bit, but Mike, you know, he's a little bit more warmed up, so like that, so then we'll just start to work a little bit more. He gets a noodle. You know, I talk trash. And you'll see that once he starts to warm up a little bit more and he gets looser, I'll hit him less and less to where I can't hit him. You know, Mike, one of, one of the things that, that, uh, that I noticed here is that you see, like, in the Olympics and all this, you know, heavy competition, you got people that start their fields and, and their um, their sports as children and work their way up. And, and unless I got this wrong, it wasn't until 2008 where you made the decision to go into, you know, fighting MMA. Is, is that the case there? Yeah. Um. <laughs> wow. So how do you go from from making a decision and four years later you're the heavyweight champion of the world. I, I started training out of my buddy's garage, my first trainer, Will Hammond, um, and the White Buffalo Warriors. I trained out of his garage for about six weeks and he got me an amateur fight and it just, it worked. It, it went well. I enjoyed it. I mean, it, man, it, it's tough getting in there. The nerves and everything of the day before the fight and the day of the fight, but as soon as you get in the cage and everything just disappears, it's just you and the other person. Mike hits the guy, you know, two, three times in the face, you know, and next thing you know, the guy's not as good as Mike on the ground because Mike's unflappable. And that's the X factor that you really can't talk about. That's why he wins fights only training for such a short time because he's just so mentally tough. You're never going to break him. He's never been finished in a fight, which right there says that you have an unbelievable heart, you know. And that's something that's a trainer's dream. I mean, that's easy for me to work with. If I know the guy's never going to quit, you know, we have at least now we have five rounds as the champ, five rounds to do whatever we do to finish the guy. Five rounds is all I need. It's going to be we'll tough be for guy. somebody to beat me yeah. in five rounds. We'll beat a guy in five rounds, <laughs> no problem, you know. And, and we, I, we have that luxury where I can go out with this guy and say, hey, Mike's never going to quit. So, dude, we don't have to win the first round. We don't have to win the second round. We don't have to win the third round. We don't have to win the fourth round. We fight. We make it a war. We make it ugly. We make it grueling and play a game of human chicken. And I know one thing. He's the strongest mental heavyweight in the world. I don't think there's anybody stronger mentally than him. So as long as we make the fight go five rounds, we're going to win every time. You know, that's a great luxury for a trainer to have. It makes my job pretty damn easy. That's a trump card that people don't understand, I think. And uh, it's, it's our weapon, ultimately. Unfortunately, he's finishing guys too fast so we can't make it. <laughs> but I'm okay with that. that Many of the fighters that, that you come up against are a lot more experienced. You know, some of them in their disciplines are the master of, you know, black belts and, and things like that. I mean, how do you, with your four years of experience, how do you overcome something like that? 
I feel like a lot of the fighters out there that have spent their whole lives training in a specific art, whether it's you know Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Muay Thai um, or whatever it might be, I feel like it honestly it hinders a lot of them um, because it, when you take it into the sport of MMA, it exposes uh, glaring weaknesses in their game, and it's so hard for some of those people to break that habit. Um, I always look back and go, man, I wish I had wrestled in high school. I wish, wish I had wrestled in college. And Eric, uh, my trainer, tells me it's probably better that I didn't because I'm not coming in with some of those really bad habits. Um, you know, wrestlers, they keep their hands down. Um, they don't have to keep their hands up they, when they're uh, wrestling. But in fighting, it's a different story. Um, they, they can give up their back in wrestling. In fighting, you don't give up your back. Um, it's a big mistake. So for those guys that have been trained that for years and years and years, it's a hard thing for them to break those habits. So for me, um, I, I've been able to come into it just learning everything all at once. When, when you're in there in the ring with your opponent, are you focusing on their, their head, their shoulders, their waist? You know, How do you know where they're going to move? You get focused on the person's head and on their eyes. And you can't do that because if the person's good, then they can sell you, you know, with their eyes and then hit you, you know, move, hit you, take you down, whatever, without you seeing it. But really, you should be looking, you know, like right here, like shoulder down to waist. And then you can see everything because you know where the person's head is. If you can see right here, you know exactly where their head is. So you shouldn't be looking at the head. Also, keeps the chin down. And that's the most important thing. When the guys want to look in the eyes, their chin comes up. So they should be concentrated on chin down like this, hiding behind their shoulders when they throw, and the peripheral vision, I look right out on the top of my eyes and I can see really no higher than here. But that's like I said, I, I know if I throw a punch right over here, I'm hitting the chin, because their chin should be buried too. So that's, you know, it accomplishes what I needed to accomplish. Um, I can go into a fight, I could go into a fight without a corner man, and I would be okay. I, I could survive through a fight, but like I said, it makes me twice as good if I, do, if I can shut my brain off, especially once I get tired, and he can see stuff from the other side, you know, a different perspective that's not getting punches thrown at their face. He can look at it like a movie and dissect it and go, okay, this is what Mike needs to do to beat this guy. Uh, makes it really easy on me if I have a trainer that can properly convey that to me while I'm fighting without getting all amped up and excited and just like, kill him, kick him in the head, you know, <laughs> punch him in the face which I've had that um, before, and I've seen that a lot. And, you know, nothing against it. It is what it is, but it doesn't help the fighter um, that much. And so that's a, that's a big thing for me and for any other fighters out there that have a trainer like that that they can trust. So Eric kind of, like, guides you through a maze. I mean, mm -hmm. allows you to, like you said, just shut down your brain and just kind of focus on what he is directing you. So is, is that probably some of the magic that's helping you overcome all these people with years and years of experience there yeah he he really he's so good at just guiding me um especially when it hits the ground like when it, when it's standing up you know kind of let me do my own thing he'll sit back and you know call out a combo or something for me to do or tell me in between rounds but man when it hits the ground i mean that's where most of these guys they're either wrestlers or brazilian jiu-jitsu black belts and have been for years and so that's supposedly the dangerous ground for me uh, as a guy with no experience in either. Um, yeah, for me, uh, I'm pretty good at staying calm w when I'm fighting. Um, I generally don't get too overwhelmed. And so I'm able to just go back to my training and my instinct if I'm not listening to my corner, uh, which is decent. You know, I've learned quite a bit in the past four years, but it's still only four years and only two years with Eric, um, you know, high level ground guy. So compared to a guy who's been doing it for 20, 25 years, when I get down on the ground in his territory, um, I could be in huge trouble at that point. So that's when I got to rely on, one, my cardio and just staying calm um, and mixing in punches, too, so that I don't, uh, so I'm throwing them off their game a little bit because wrestling and jujitsu, you obviously can't punch. So that mixes it up a little. But then the other thing that makes it so different for me is that Eric is so good at conveying um, what I need to do when I'm on the ground. I mean, it's, it's not even just like, try this move, then try this move. It's like, put your right hand on his left wrist. Now step your leg over his head. Now arch your back and twist this way. And I mean, I can literally shut my brain off at that point 
when I'm on the ground and just listen to him and know that I'm, you know, instantly like a black belt. Um, and it's really, it's amazing. And uh, he, uh, I wish I could give him more recognition for it. I think he, he'll get it over time. Um, people will see, but it, it's amazing how he does it. When you won the title, um, you, you had the monster of a guy in a triangle choke. Mm -hmm. And did you feel that that was slipping? Uh, no, I had the triangle choke in uh, pretty tight on him, but just not quite tight enough to finish it. And I was just trying to figure out how, and then I, you know, listen, and I heard Eric uh, asking for the Kimura, or asking for me to reach with my right hand and get his hand uh, off my head. And as soon as I did that, that Kimura was right there. So I was able to just release the triangle and uh, do what I knew how to do. Wow. So that was definitely a team effort that, that mm -hmm. won that. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's phenomenal there. Well, so basically if there's some kid in Texas or North Carolina, they need to find an Eric, right? They need to move to <laughs> they need Tuckwilla, to, Washington. They need to move to Tuckwilla. Forget finding an Eric. Just come and get the yeah, original. It's nice up here <laughs> two months out of the year. <laughs> two months out Maybe of the year. Maybe three. Yeah, as long well, you're training indoors anyway. So, yeah, that's yeah, right. As long as you got web feet and if you like to ski, get your cardio going. Yeah, that's right. You know, put some, slap some 200s on and down the hill you go, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's my training <laughs> regimen. Well, Eric, you've been doing this for, what, 20 years now? Yeah, just a, just a hair, a couple months under 20 years. What, what was it like when this first started? I mean, how was it looked upon? And, and well, we were outlaws. There's no question. Um, it was all illegal. Fights were illegal. Um, a lot of the productions would get shut down. Um, sometimes they were shut down on fight day. There was uh, a couple productions I'd seen and, and been on where when you were walking into the ring for the first fight, the cops showed up and shut it down and ran everybody out of there. And... Uh, you know, eventually it became a little bit more socially acceptable, and obviously now it's just huge. Um, so it's nice to see it's recognized more as, as a sport. When he tapped out in, in Dubai and you, you won the title, what went through your head when you felt that? Um, kind of a surreal feeling. It was like, man, I know that I just hit that Kimura perfectly, but did he really just tap out? Um, I, I knew that I had won, but it's just one of those things where it's like, wow, it just, it really just happened. It's over. Now I can enjoy this, uh, this trip and celebrate a little bit and, um, you know, see what comes next in my career. How do you feel about, you know, fighting, um, U.S. fighters versus, uh, foreign fighters? I, I feel like it, you just need to go wherever the competition is. Um, there's awesome fighters throughout the whole world. And as this sport grows, you're going to see better fighters pop out from all different areas. Uh, guys that maybe do have a long history of a certain discipline, um, you know, like Muay Thai guys um, that have been doing it for ages. And they've started within the past few years of training MMA. Um, you're going to see those guys come out a lot more and, and other areas around the world as well. Um, so having, uh, yeah, American fighters fight uh, across the world, it's not, you know, it's, it's no different than fighting in the States. It's just another opponent, a guy who's brave enough to get in the cage with you and may the best man win. Different food. Different food. That's <laughs> a big part of it. <laughs> Trying to figure out pre-fight meals is uh, kind of tough. Now, what about acclimating to time? Um, so this last fight in Dubai, that was my first uh, the Dubai fight was my first one uh, traveling internationally, and I don't think it affected me that much while I was over there. The time difference, um, I was, you know, you get enough adrenaline when fight night comes. You got plenty of adrenaline to get you through any of that. Um, so I was making sure that I slept, uh, you know, changed my schedule, got out in the sun beforehand to get tired, getting my workouts in during the day. And Cage Warriors did good. They flew me over there a good, like, four days uh, before um, which was awesome. A, a lot of companies won't do that. Um, so I, I didn't really feel any of the time issues or any of that, no jet lag, until I got back home. <laughs> when I got back home, my wife picked me up from the airport, I went and gotten some food, and I told her, drop me off, I'm going to sleep for a few hours, I can't function. <laughs> well, you texted me pretty fast, so that was cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, what about timing as far as the fight goes? I mean, can you can you eat too soon? A, before a fight or maybe not soon enough or drinking tell me a little bit about that so i think 
the nutrition before a fight is a, almost like a lost art that you don't see a lot of uh, fighters pay attention to. And for me, nutrition is such a huge part of my life. I can't work out. If I don't eat within you know, a certain time period, hour and a half tops uh, before my workout, then I can't work out. I just, uh, my energy level instantly goes down. So that's extremely important, and it's been a learning process for me you know, over my 20-something fights, trying to figure out uh, what to eat, when to eat it, um, and what your stomach can handle at that point. Because the nerves, honestly, the nerves make it almost impossible to get down like a meal. It, it just it doesn't work. So I've had to go to uh, protein shakes. That's something that works really well for me and is pretty easy on the stomach. But you still got to try to time it out, and that's very difficult, especially being like the last fight of the night. Um, you don't know how fast the other fights are going to go. Um, they could last 30 seconds, or they could last 15, 20 minutes each. So it, it's a very, very difficult thing. Wow. So, so let's say today you're going to have a fight, and you're the main event. So walk me through a timeline of what you would do when you wake up to the time you go in and, and defend your title. So when I'm preparing for a fight, it usually kind of starts uh, the night before. I'll make sure that I stay up a little bit later, um, you know, try to stay up until like midnight or so, um, just to see if I can sleep in a little bit longer. Sometimes, I'll, depending on how I'm feeling, I'll even stay up until 2 or 3 in the morning um, and then try to sleep in until 10, 11, noon. Um, it's difficult because you get the anxiety and everything like building up to the fight, um, but it's just something that you got to work on. Uh, when I first wake up, eat a good breakfast, make sure I'm getting great water intake through the day. What um, would be a good breakfast? So a good breakfast for me, uh, usually like eggs and oatmeal. That's pretty standard. Um, nice part about that is that traveling most places, you can get that anywhere. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's what I always eat for breakfast, throwing you know, toast, fruit, something like that. Um, then lunch, I'll have like a normal lunch. Um, totally depends on where I'm fighting. Um, and you what know, would your I'm, ideal lunch be? So ideal lunch would be, you know, maybe like some chicken and brown rice, um, and some vegetables. Um, that's pretty solid lunch for me, but I could do, you know, a sandwich, um, just nothing, nothing really heavy. Um, nothing with a lot of sauce, just trying to keep it pretty clean. Uh, as you get closer to the fight, so, you know, that probably puts me around like 3, 3.30 in the afternoon, go into the rules meeting um, to kind of time it out, get my snacks in there, uh, get a protein bar or a protein shake. At that point, my nerves are starting to play up quite a bit. So I got to move around a little bit, kind of ease uh, off the nerves. Um, if I have time, go and try to eat one more meal, um, you know, around like 5 or 5.30. And that's the tough one, to stomach that. And I know that I need the food, so you try to get that food down, but everything's just going all crazy in your stomach and body and in your head. So that's the really tough meal to get down. What would your ideal meal be at um, that point? Same thing at that point. I'm doing uh, you know, chicken and rice, um, and I can vary off that a little bit. Uh, I can get potatoes in and whatever, uh, get some fruit in. Um, but pretty standard, trying to keep it pretty easy on the stomach. Uh, from there, it's just a matter of timing. Um, I got to make sure that I eat like an hour and a half uh, before the fight, and so eating, you know, that could mean a protein shake. Uh, most likely for me, that's what I do is a protein shake at that point. Um, and then it's just getting in the water, um, getting in like a piece of fruit if I still feel like I need a little bit in my stomach, and then getting the supplements timed out correctly, uh, making sure like my energy supplements and endurance supplements and everything are timed out good. What kind of supplements do you take? Uh, I use a product line called Advocare. Um, I'm just very clean, all regulated by the NCAA uh, or allowed by the NCAA and uh, reg regulated by the FDA. Um, very good products though. I feel the difference. I know that I'm getting quality stuff and I, I just love them. It works for me. What's your your goal or your method of choice for hydrate, keeping hydrated? Uh, I I just do water to keep hydrated. Um, I'll you know if I need to, if I feel like I need to replenish my electrolytes a little bit, I'll drink some uh, Gatorade or like uh, I'm using a product called Rehydrate now from um, from Advocare. 
same type of thing, uh, just trying to replace your electrolytes and keep you hydrated there, but e mainly ever, water. Ever do any of the coconut water thing? Have you tried that? No, or? I haven't. I've heard that it's good stuff, but I've never done coconut water before. Tastes nasty, but it's you know, phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, I know uh, Matt Hasselbeck, ex-Seahawk, he recommended that. Uh, he was big on it. I, I've it. talked to some guys that, uh, especially after um, weigh-in, We'll mm -hmm. go straight to the coconut water, mm -hmm. and and that's a good one there. You know, tell me about you know leading up to the weigh-in to make sure that you make the weight. What is your plan there? Uh, my plan is to eat a lot because I'm a small heavyweight. I'm never in any danger of missing weight. Um, that's one of the big issues I think in MMA is the heavyweight class. It's uh, all the other weight classes are 15 to 20 pound ranges, and heavyweight is 206 to 265. It's ridiculous. Wow. It's yeah, it's 60 pound range doesn't make any sense. Um, and I'm right in the middle of it. So I will really be a strong advocate of getting another weight class in there. <laughs> um, I, I weigh at like 235, 230 all the time. So yeah, making weights not a problem for me. I basically go to the weigh ins, um, ask them whether I can wear my jeans on the scale or not to add some weight. <laughs> and uh, that's about it. Well, you know, and, and that could be to your advantage there too, because if you got a guy that you know that's that's much bigger, I mean, that could be an advantage. But he could also be starving and in, in, in you know dehydrating himself to make that weight, mm -hmm. which puts you in a much better position strength-wise. Yeah, that's that's one of the big advantages I have as a heavyweight. I like fighting the guys. Uh, well, I shouldn't say I like it because it kind of sucks fighting somebody who outweighs you by. 60 pounds come fight time um, but it's a big advantage when you get into round two and three especially um, a, a guy that's that big that's throwing that hard or wrestling that much they just can't keep it up and especially if they're having to cut weight and they don't do it properly maybe or uh, even if they do do it properly it's still you can't make up for that uh, the loss of fluid and everything so the, the big weight cuts it, you know when you get into the third round it's just it's not going to work for you so, you know, in, with all sports, you know, people always want to, you know, drink what you're drinking, eat what you're eating, you know, use the same equipment. Um, do people come up and volunteer themselves as sponsors, and what kind of a role does that play to help you out in your career? Yeah, that's a big part. The sponsorship's a big part of uh, the fight game because uh, as fighters, we don't get paid that much. Um, a lot of people look at it like a glorious uh, job that you have being a pro fighter, but man, I don't make enough to support my family. At the, you know, until you get to like the highest, highest level um, and continue to win there, um, that's where you start to make enough money. Um, so the sponsorships make a big difference when you have uh, people that step up, and I mean, it's great advertising for a sponsor to be seen, you know, uh, across the world on TV. Um, and the amount that they have to pay for that, it's pretty ridiculous, like how cheap it is for some of them. So who are some of the people that are currently sponsoring you right now? So right now I have Advocare sponsoring me for all of my supplements. Um, this last fight, Yellow Jacket brand clothing, they stepped up and uh, sponsored me for my shorts um, and some training gear. Um, and then I have uh, lots of other random uh, uh, sponsors. Syndicate Fight Shop has always stepped up and been good for me. Um, COB clothing, uh, that's been a big one that's helped me out throughout the time, high-powered entertainment. Uh, Owens Meats, uh, it's a local company for me. Um, I, it's a butcher shop Protein. that I go and uh, they, they help me out. They hook me up with all my meat and they've paid me and helped me with my training. Um, so that's an awesome place in uh, Cleveland, Washington. Hey, if you're Rock ever going through there, stop by. <laughs> Rocky did that. I remember yep. he wore that on his on the back, and yep. he did all his training. Do you ever bust ribs in there? In no, house? I should. They, they've offered. <laughs> have, they told me to come and do that it. That would be a great footage right yeah, there. Yeah, it would. That would be way cool to do that. But, you know, with all the training, and we're going to get some footage of you doing some training here in a little while, but, you know, with all the, you know, the supplements and the training and stuff like that, I mean, you could be in the best shape in the world, but as far as your mind goes, without Eric, you wouldn't be sitting where you're sitting today, would you? No, I definitely would not. Hi, my name is Eric Dahlberg. I'm head coach at Ring Demon in Tuckville, Washington. And this is my fighter, world champion Mike Hayes. I'm Mike 300 Hayes, Cage Warriors Fighting Championship, heavyweight champion of the world. And you are watching Rock This Magazine. <laughs>